Whoa, check it out. I think this is the most armoured and armed I've ever been for a video. <laughs> yeah, baby. Greetings, I am Shad, and in this episode of Fantasy Rearmed, we are going to be looking at the bow, specifically different ideas or potential techniques that could be used in a fantasy setting, because the, some of the concepts that we're going to be looking at here, there is at least no evidence of them being done historically, and the practical validity of them is something that is worth questioning, which is what we're going to be doing in this video. Now, before we begin, uh, there is one interesting thing that I've kind of learnt with my experimentation with the medieval longbow with wearing a sword and all the kit on and I think there's a good answer or reason why uh, there is not a prominent idea of the medieval longbowman or just war bow uh, wearing or using two-handed swords because this is getting in the way a lot. Like seriously, if I want to lean into the bow of things, the handle is literally getting in the way so much. And so if uh, you're doing, you know, fantasy and things or adaptation or looking at that, uh, there is a functional reason why two-handed swords like this might not be the best reason. Now, one option is to really slide it around and get it out of the way of the bow. Or the other option is, is to just use a one-handed weapon, because this is the thing, if you ever do get in a scuffle and uh, you get charged, and you're, a, you know, an archer, to use a two-handed weapon, you would literally need to ditch your bow, throw it aside, and then draw the long sword, and then uh, go to town. But with a one-handed weapon, you can actually protect your longbow bit, you know, deal with who you need to do, uh, you know, deal with, and then... Uh, Gosh, even putting it away one hand is a bit difficult. And then hope that uh, your bow wasn't, the string wasn't damaged or broken or cut in, in half and things, and anything like that. So, ah, uh, out of convenience, I'm going to be removing my two-handed sword. But there is another thing that could actually solve this, and that's right, my back scabbard. In actual fact, I think uh, having a two-handed sword on your back uh, certainly gets it out of the way. You, like I said, you can slide it behind a bit more, but it still has the same issue of it's a two-handed weapon. And so. I'm going to grab my uh, one-handed sword, and let's see how how much that gets in the way. All right, my one-handed, you know, sword right there. <laughs> Already, it's like night and day. Look at how low that hangs down, and it's out of the way. And this, is, this isn't going to be getting in the way when I draw this as well. And uh, one thing I've actually noticed, I haven't shot in mail. And so let me, I just want to test this because this video isn't going to be an exploratory video of different interesting things that might arise in regards to using, you know, a longbow specifically and different ways it could be used. And so we're going to be exploring using the longbow as a melee weapon itself. If you don't have a, you know, a backup or is it is one better than the other? It's an interesting idea. But also, could you use a longbow, or any bow really, with a shield on that arm? What are the pros and cons? So there's actually a lot of fun things we're going to be exploring in this video. And so, first thing that we're already discussing now, is how much uh, everything you're wearing could get in the way with the archery. And seriously, let's, I also, armor as well. I've never shot while wearing armor. And so just briefly, I'm going to, you know, draw my bow a couple of times, get the feel of it, because, whoa, whoa, I tell you what, I mean, Fantasy and stuff like that to have adventurers just walking around and wearing mail like it's clothing. They're obviously stronger and tougher than me. And, you know, military unit soldiers did march while wearing armor in some instances, not in every instance. And uh, in my video, what, you know, armor is best for a medieval adventurer, I do say, and I kind of found that that doesn't seem to be the preferred thing. If you had the option to not wear your armor while traveling over long distances, you wouldn't. But as an adventurer, you might, you know, get attacked by monsters or bandits, and so you might just have to deal with it. And they would just have to uh, harden up. I guess I just have to harden up because this is 10 kilos of extra weight, I believe, uh, last time I checked. Um, ah, but so, you know, there's not much, like there is a little restriction. See, when I do this, um, suddenly it gets a bit, uh, so if I, but that's because it's tucked into the belt so much. If I really uh, loosen up the waist a bit, um, uh, let it loose around there and I can actually feel the mail kind of ride up a bit and so now okay that's freed up my range of movement and uh, yep all right so armor um, and of course you know archers did wear armor historically uh, not all the time but 
absolutely you can do it. So that's it. But what also we noticed, sword. That wasn't getting in the way at all. It's even with it off to the side a little bit. Now granted, my long sword was uh, particularly up a bit in terms of where it was hanging on the belt, but long swords kind of need to hang a bit higher because their blades are so long. And so to keep them a good distance and a convenient distance from the ground and knocking things and even knocking the ground, there is a tendency to wear them a little bit higher or more of an angle. But having a long sword on more of an angle because advantage about one-handed swords is that they can hang straight, but long swords, because they're so long, uh, ha having them hang on an angle will get the blade off the ground, but that means the handle is protruding forward more, which can be very detrimental when you're using a bow, because when you use a bow, you stand sideways, and that's how you do it. So the handle would be protruding that way. So, okay, I think there is a very logical, valid reason for a long bowmen, or just bowmen in general, having a, you know, the, uh, the reputation of only using one-handed swords, okay, as a, their backup weapon, and not two-handed swords. And if you think it was because it was illegal for anyone other than knights to use two-handed swords like the long sword, well, I have a whole video debunking that myth. It's certainly uh, a concept that you could break, but this would be an interesting thing in when you're looking at adapting medieval stuff into fantasy, role-playing games, and everything like that, giving someone an appropriate penalty for their archery, you know, attack rolls or whatever, if they have a two-handed sword hanging on their side. Also, let me just say, like, there is uh, something that would, if I was, like, dressed like this in the medieval period, so there is a, something that would kind of stand out quite atrociously to uh, people who lived in their time. Um, because I'm not saying everything is accurate, I'm not wearing correct shoes or anything like that. But the gambit in the mail, the thing is, the look at what's happening with the mail over here, do you see this? So, mail in the medieval period was tailored and tight. Tailored and tight um, to the wearer. And what I'm wearing here, it would look very ragtag, like I've picked up some other guy's mail, which did happen. I'm not saying this isn't out of the ordinary, but it would look like it would look more cheap and look lesser kind of official, or like that's definitely that mail wasn't made for you, man. It's like, yeah, I know. I grabbed it off a corpse over there or something. So of course it was done, but if you had the money, you would get mail that was tailored to you because this, you know, it can be restrictive and get in the way. So that's just something to point out that is an, just an interesting anecdote to, to mention. And the reason why this one is so big is um, for two reasons. One, uh, I bought it to go over my thick gamison. You know, the thick gamison of classic shad, which I'll still wear now and then. I bought that to go over that one. And that gamison is already really big because it was uh, <laughs> uh, measured to my, the size of that time. And uh, I'm not sure if you notice, I've been been slimming down a bit. Oh, awesome, that's pretty cool. Uh, and so it's not only bigger in size for just my natural proportions now, it's also bigger because it's meant to go over a gambeson, not under a gambeson. But hey, this looks cool, okay? It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool setup. And by the way, historically, gambesons were worn both over and under mail, all right? So personal preference. Okay, so now let's explore some of the interesting things that um, might arise in combat in different combinations. How do I put the bow down? when I'm getting these really big bulky shields. Stay. Stay. Boromir, we know how much you love bows. You look after mine. Uh, 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 okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, these uh, shields were a bit too awesome to pass up. When I saw them, I, 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 I had to get them. And I've been waiting for an excuse to use them in a video for ages, and now I do! I have, I have an excuse. So I got all these. Can you even see this? Like, I got this. Oh, look at, look at all this. And uh, no, not sponsored. I bought these with my own money because when I see something that is cool and worth it, I get it. And if you're wondering, these are made by Epic Armory. And the reason why I like these ones particularly is they're big. Okay. And so just like real historical shields, because a lot of um, the safe foam shields you buy online these days are made to fall into conjunction with certain LARP rules and there's a size limit. And that's just crazy to me. It's like, shields! I like big shields and I cannot lie. So, uh, you other medieval enthusiasts can't deny. Uh, I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop, we're not going there, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, I love big shields. And uh, Epic Armory makes some really good big shields, so. Ooh. Gotta get my hand on. So, all right, we're going. So, you holding or using a shield while you're using a bow. Is it even possible? Can you do it? Of course, it's gonna depend on the type of shield. Something like this, or the center grip, has a really big problem because one, 
there's a lot of meat that you're holding with the handle, and as soon as you try and hold the bow in conjunction with it, well, <laughs> it's not gonna work, eh? See, but, uh, get the bow there, get the, and, 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 no, no, no. So, uh, that shield is a pass. I love the big round shield, but no, it's not gonna work. Uh, oh, by the way, like, what, another reason why I bought these is for HEMA as well. I think these are actually legitimately good for HEMA because um, I have uh, more, more accurate, they're kind of more accurate, it has a metal rim, um, wooden shields that I've made myself, right? But they're dangerous, sparring with them, right? Whew, cut, I've cut myself on it. In fact, there's a video where I cut myself when I was sparring with my brother Joss. And, um, and uh, not only just cutting, I just they're hard and solid. You should use, you know, ones that are accurate to get the weight and feel. But in terms of sparring and safety, foam ones, I mean, like a lot of LARP equipment is perfectly adaptable into historical European martial arts practice in certain realms. Not universally, but anyway. So that's that. So that shield doesn't work. Now, out, of, out for the fun of it, all right, let's, uh, let's look at even a bigger shield. Let's look at, well, I mean... <sighs> Technically, uh, well, not technically, look, casually, it's a tower shield, which is a casual term for shields that are really big. Uh, and there's a family of shields, okay, that fall into that category. So, the Pavese, all right, there's one. The classic Roman Scutum, okay, so uh, it, it kind of applies to a family of shields and the really big kite shields, like the big kite shields, uh, as big as a person kite shields, could fall into the tower shield family. So, this one here is a more fantasy interpretation of a tower shield, and by the way, they're not accurate, these ones. Um, I would love historically accurate versions of these, but they are made with like m thick metal, well, the thickness is the safety, that's fine, but the metal rims, I don't like that. Oh man, that would make a shield ridiculously heavy. So basically, look, no, it's for fun. You're not going to be able to use a bow in conjunction with something like this. But there is an interesting utility that you could get out of this is that um, scutums, all right, absolutely can be uh, worn like this. And uh, indeed, it's one of the ways in which they were carried. Sorry if that's getting on the mic. And so being able to protect, this could actually give you full protection on this side of the body when you're shooting. Okay, uh, which isn't bad, it's not terrible, it's, it's certainly uh, is cumbersome, and that would be the biggest reason why I don't think anyone would have done it historically, is because like, if you're going to be carrying a shield like this, I mean, you're not going to be using a bow, in all honesty, you're going to be using a sword and getting the full protective value out of the shield and turn it into an active item of defense where you can actually hold it and use it. Um, it can be strapped to your arm or anything like that, so, so. Uh, tower shield is a no, but of course all of you astute viewers, I'm sure you've come to the same conclusion that I'm ultimately coming to as well, and you've already probably known this for a good while, and that is strapped on shields that are smaller. Now this one is still big, this is about as big as you can go, and so if you're going to be holding it in the center like kite shields for me, center, you know, handhold is the best in my opinion, I actually love a horizontal a uh, handhold, and you can do it with these straps, you just strap them horizontally, I haven't done that, and uh, too, too much time, but anyway, so, love the kite shield, but, of course, kite shield, you can absolutely strap it to your arm. Okay, all right, we're getting there, we are getting there, where's my back, I, oh, gosh, oh, I need to harden up, I'm not used to wearing stuff like this, I'm a modern, I'm a modern, you know, modern man, right, I like so, okay, we've got, strapped onto your arm. I don't prefer straps myself. It's not to say because, well, in all honesty, straps can work fine, but I've actually strapped it so I'm not holding any, I've freed up that hand completely. Usually the strap would go over my palm here, which would give me some control over the, you know, movement that way. And I don't actually have that because again, I need to hold my bow. Now, interestingly, huh, I would need it strapped further up. It's already, uh, like, if we, it's going to work, it needs to be further up. But, um, bear with me, I'll, I'll try and strap it further up. I think I did it! <laughs> I think I did it. Okay, so, um, some things to consider. Uh, how functional would the shield be? I can use it. Got a, got a bit of a vulnerability in my hand there, but if I curve it in. All right, oh, look, I have a mostly functional shield, which is still very, it's a bit awkward. Sword is getting away a bit, but okay, okay, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of working. And can, okay, okay, um, so far so good. Um, there, 
depending on the size of the shield. But honestly, I think uh, the limitation I'm about to bring up now would be applicable to even smaller shields. So I would be looking at uh, Rotellas or the Taj and stuff like that. Um, Bucklers are not strapped, so the Rotella and the Taj, are, those are strapped on shields, but buckler is held, so that's going to have an issue. But you'll need to be strapped on, there are smaller strapped on shields that certainly could work, okay? And if you can get your hand out, the issue would actually be uh, <laughs> da -da, the, the controversy, the great controversy of recent Shadowversity memory. The side in which you place the arrow. Uh, so if you're actually going to try and do this, okay, I, I, you, you, you potentially could um, do this with the arrow on the left side, okay? You need a weaver, and the thing is, this is, this is where you got to weave the arrow through. See that? Got to weave the arrow through right there, okay? Um, I think putting it on this side and then down is an option. You have to kind of, oh, it's awkward anything okay okay and then it's, it's caught on the sword because i had the bow you know hanging out on that end uh so all right and, and then after all that and we know how much i think speed is important which i actually do um oh uh, and yeah and so i'm gonna keep it off the string in case it accidentally fires but then uh, whoa. all right all right so clearly clearly um if you're ever going to be doing this it is orders of magnitude easier to just have the arrow on the right side. And you can lean, oh, look at that. That was a lot easier. Okay, so in terms of functionality, what can be done? Arrow on the right side makes it orders of magnitude easier to be able to shoot with an arrow, with a, with, <laughs> with a shield strapped to your arm. It is so awkward. I don't see many people doing, but having said that, okay, having said that, uh, I had a bit of a chat with this with the master archer Lars Anderson himself a while back. It, well, in actual fact, he reached out to me because I mentioned that I, originally I thought it wasn't going to work. He's like, hey, just let you know, he's done it before and he made it work really well. Smaller shield, um, but because, of course, he shoots on the right, he was able to make it work really well in uh, certain war games he has done and, and uh, also LARP games and things. And so uh, this shield in particular, I think, is, is still way too big for it because the protruding bottom of the kite shield is getting in the way of my sword a lot and it's hanging down and things but if we could pretend that I was smaller and it wasn't getting in the way like that I'll take this off the string so it won't dry fire okay when I say dry when I want it, so it won't actually fire dry fire is not firing 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 in fact I shoot should be shoot even though common vernacular people understand what I'm saying. This is what, I don't stress about the, the semantics of language like that in a casual video like this. If I was writing something in the medieval period, I wouldn't say fire, all right? But for casual, you understand what I'm saying and that's, what, that's what's needed. Okay, so, um, ah. see, I was holding the string way too much, but yeah, this is actually perfectly possible, perfectly possible as to how functional it would be. That's another topic completely as to how useful because there is one thing you got to do when you be shooting a bow. Conventional wisdom for shooting a bow, but I won't say universally it must be done. Uh, as I've discovered more recently, there's a lot of different ways you can shoot a bow. And if it works and it hits the target, all power to you, right? That, that's my stance on the matter. Um, but the original thing is uh, to extend your arm. Shields are meant to protect you. And uh, to get the best utility out of a shield is that you would want to use the shield to protect the largest parts of your body, center of mass and all that stuff. And so the question is, when I get an arrow out and I get ready to shoot, is it protecting my body? No, no it's not. And so you would get very little protective value out of having a shield strapped to your arm when you're actually shooting the bow itself Though, I'm mean, not to say it's useless, okay, in between shooting, and so you're loose, you shoot, and then you can block. That's right. So this could be, yeah, you're defended, you're defended, you're defended, and, and look, you can keep yourself protected, um, you know, while you're getting the arrow ready, and as soon as it's ready, you can then open up, aim, shoot, and then once it's shot, protection again. It's like, what an interesting idea. I wonder if that would work in a shield wall. I say this is the fun thing because we're like when we're talking about fantasy rearmed, we're thinking about outside the box things that 
Could you justify in a fantasy setting? Like, look, I have no record, I have come across no record or evidence at all. This was ever done historically. And there are so many issues that I'm finding as too awkward for me if it was smaller. I don't know, but that, that concept or idea right then, protected, you're protected, and then you go open up to, to shoot, and then protected, protected, and yeah, yeah, then again, load, and then open up. That could be a very interesting specific formation kind of technique for a fantasy army or something like that. Um, and if you get in trouble, okay, have a pretty good protection. You would have to ditch. You have to just go ditch, and then sword, and oh baby, we're ready to go, come on, you know? So, it's inter interesting things. Oh, my, 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 my sheath, sheath is falling down. Ugh. Ugh. My boy, crap, there's a lot of weight on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, yeah, look, it's more awkward than efficient, in my opinion. I think there are some interesting things you could do, and so if it was small and it was less awkward, maybe it will be far more functional, okay? Uh, it would be about execution in whatever fantasy you're doing, but it's actually possible. The idea that it's impossible to have a shield strapped on your arm and to use a bow in conjunction with it is incorrect. It can be done, awkwardly, that I've found, but practice can make perfect and there are small certain adventures that you could try and accentuate. So, uh, uh, but the big thing about it, right, if you're going to be doing it uh, quick, as quickly and efficiently as you can normally, uh, sh this is one of those situations where shooting on the right of the bow is almost a necessity. You can do it on the left with the arrow poking out, as I mentioned, because look at this, the arrow the arrow, can, can you see me? Can you see? The, the, the arrow, and it pokes! The arrow pokes out! And it could shoot out uh, like that. So it's just the, the, it would really affect the speed of loading. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the weaknesses, shooting on that side. You can get fast shooting on that side. I'm not saying you can't. But having something like this set up would really restrict the speed in which you could shoot with. So, okay. Interesting things. Interesting things we are experimenting and discovering here. Ah, I need to, need to take it off. Oh, crap. Oh, oh, oh. So, here's an interesting anecdote that I'm finding. So, I've usually worn this mail over Gambeson, not underneath it. Whew. I mean, I'm only wearing a shirt underneath, and, uh, and it prevents pinching everything like that. But the shoulder parts, okay, so you know the neck opening of the, the mail, the actual edges of that mail where, the where all the weight is hanging on, it's pressing down a lot on the Oh, on my, you know, lower neck to upper shoulder area, and it's hurting. It's like, uh, so you, like, I would at least want some measure of padding, even small, underneath it. And so, I think I would prefer having a gambus and under mail because that padding really does a does a thing. Now uh, we're going into something that has been explored a bit already by wonderful YouTubers. More recently, Scarlagrim has made uh, a couple of videos exploring the viability of using ranged weapons in melee. And the bow is one of the most prominent things. So go watch Scarlagrim's videos. He uh, looks at a much broader range of weapons and some interesting things. But I'm going to be sharing my own kind of take on the matter, my own thoughts and uh, interpretations and stuff. But we're going to be focusing on the bow specifically. The bow was by far one of the most efficient, if not the very best, ranged weapon of the medieval period, okay? So that's going to be the main thing we'll be looking at. Look, crossbows, yes, crossbows, crossbows, oh. bow master ace, crossbow peasants, okay? Um, sorry, Todd. <laughs> Sacrilege. Okay, so as a weapon, the thing about using a bow as a melee weapon, honestly, uh, it's going to be a matter of context. Go away, Matt! Stop it! I can use the word as well, okay? Context uh, about what type of bow, because, like, uh, let, 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 me, let, me get my, let me get my other bows, okay? Uh, so, yeah. I, I've been building, I like bows, bows, bows are fun. It's only the beginning. Okay, so depends on the type of bow. So uh, when you look at a uh, recurved flat bow, and this is not a uh, historical one because, of course, window cut out and so everything. This is my, my lovely bow that I inherited from my father. It's older. I think it's older than me. Like, it is older than me. Like, it's a beautiful bow. But anyway, uh, the limbs have no mass in them, okay? And so striking with the limbs is going to have bare, like, look, you could hurt someone, okay? Uh, but 
There's not, there's nothing compared to a good solid stick, okay? That's uh, gonna be a big issue. Are you like, ah, uh, no, no. And, uh, and so if we look at a more historically uh, uh, accurate, you know, Asiatic style recurve flat bow, uh, the other one was also a flat bow, flat bow referring to uh, flat limbs. Um, this one is light, okay? So, so little mass. And honestly, whew, like, do you, do you see it wobble? Like, this is also a very light bow, by the way. In a pinch, you could whack someone as hard as you can with it, but with something as thin as this, and this is one of the biggest concerns I would have about using a bow as a melee weapon, is that for something like this, you would most definitely damage it before you, like, if you're gonna damage someone else, you're probably doing as much, uh, enough force to easily damage the bow as well. And then you lost your bow. If it's the last resort that you have, that uh, they're in melee, you don't have time to draw, you know, another arrow and shoot or anything like that. And you just, all you can do is whack, sure, but you're probably gonna lose your bow at the same time. And the question is, why would you ever resort to whacking someone with a bow when you can easily just go like this and defend yourself with a sword? Because medieval bowmen, all right? Of course, in most instances, I'm not saying it was never done, that they didn't have a backup weapon, but it'd be rather silly to go into war without a backup melee weapon if you ever get in a pinch and all you're armed with is with a bow, an arrow, okay? So the biggest question that will ever arise about using a bow specifically as a melee weapon is why would you ever do that over your backup weapon, your sword? This is made for melee, all right? That's, that's the question, but there is there is a bit more to this, okay? You might think, well, it's under, you'd never, you'd never do it, okay? Uh, you can, and the great thing, again, as I was saying before, one-handed weapons, is that you can still hold your bow and defend yourself and use your sword in all the other, you know, great ways and everything. You can still be a very effective soldier um, with a one-handed weapon. And then, as soon as you might free up some room, you're not under threat, okay? You can easily put your sword back where it belongs and get back to work, baby. So, uh, yeah, but I said there is more to this, okay? Because uh, context, right? It's about which type of bow. And in terms of these thinner bows, smaller bows, I'm not gonna say lighter, because you can get really heavy 100 pound bows that are you know, similar dimensions to this, small and stuff. Uh, so, uh, but even those ones, they do not have uh, complementary dimensions for combat. The bow, honestly, and this isn't European bias or whatever like that, it's like when I seriously look at it, okay, the bow that has the most complementary dimensions to possibly be adapted effectively into melee combat, it's the long bow. One of the main reasons, it's long! Reminds me of that line from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, cause I'm so long! I, I, look, I was quoting it, I was quoting it, I wasn't referring to myself, K, okay. even though it might be true, I wasn't referring to myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think he's overcompensating for something. Um, so, yeah, uh, but, like seriously. But the thing is, not every long bow, okay? Uh, my 70 pound bow has a, a limitation that, you know, it doesn't have a lot of mass in it. I'll understream it because there are two types of ways that you'd want to use this in combat. Strung versus unstrung. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both, of course. And so, unstringing it, okay. Look at this, okay, look, look, look at this. So compare, compare this to what an Asiatic bow or similar type looks like ah, when it is unstrung, okay. So, do you see do you see potential problems that could arise if you're going to be using something like, like the uh, the force that you could apart on it is going to be distributed very poorly. So if you ever tried to poke someone with this, it's going to bend inwards and break. Uh, so that's a big weakness for bows like this. This includes a lot of recurves and everything um, uh, that you're going to be adapting to melee. But the longbow, when it's unstruck, what does it resemble? What does it look like? You don't need to be a genius. It looks like a stick. It looks like a big stick. And big long sticks are very useful in combat. You can hit things with them, but that wouldn't be the best thing to do. 
even with a longbow. Like, so before I go into ways you could use it that would be effective in combat, the, the problem with, say, the 70 pound one, as I mentioned before, it's actually not a lot of mass in it, okay? This is still a fairly thin, light piece of wood. And so it would hurt. If I, you know, wound up and just whacked someone as hard as I could, it would hurt them, okay? But there's much higher chances that you'll damage it. Cracks can appear, and as soon as you have cracks, you can get hinging and much higher likelihood of snapping when the bow gets put under proper tension when you're actually using it as a bow. That's the biggest danger. And so, the other danger is because this one is so thin and light, is there's a much higher chance that cracking and damaging will happen to it because, you know, general conventional wisdom is thicker and bigger, generally a bit more sturdy and robust. But I tell you what, when I uh, got my hands on a bigger bow, well, let me show you. So this is my 100 pound bow, it's a 100 pound bow. Did I tell you it's a 100 pound bow? It's actually a 100 pound bow, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a 100 pound. So, well, bigger bow, all right? Now, one of the first things I noticed when I was uh, dealing with this is like, Whoa, this thing is stiff, like, <laughs> like, there is so little flex in this, okay? Now think about uh, certain, you know, martial arts that use staff weapons, the bow staff. The bow staff has a very interesting characteristic that a lot of them are actually very flexible. In fact, the bow staff used for combat, like certain types, not all of them, I'm not saying all of them, I'm not saying quarter staff either, but certain martial art bow staffs have more flexibility in them than this this bow, which is made to be used as a, as, a, as a spring, as a flexible instrument, okay? And so already, whew, there would be a lot more, you know, transfer and weight transfer when you whack someone with this. And because it's, it feels stronger, okay, feels more solid, there's a much higher, you know, chance that you would damage it less, or maybe even not damage it at all, if you're going to be whacking people with it. It wouldn't be the preferred way to do it. In actual fact, there is a, a use of this, you know, unstrung uh, bow that could be uniquely effective in combat. In fact, might even be more effective than your one-handed backup weapon. And it's not to use it as a staff, but to use it as a spear, okay? Uh, there would be a much re uh, a reduced chance of damage by thrusting with this thing, okay? Because all the weight is, you know, distributed along the length and it's in line, it's a stick. It's a long straight stick, and so the force that hits here isn't gonna, it, it probably will bend after, you know, like flex, okay, not a little flex, um, uh, with a decent amount of force on it, but no, but it'll actually be able to produce a lot of. What are you doing, Boromir? You're laying down on the, look. I know you don't like arrows, I know, no sorry, I know you don't like bows, specifically heavy bows, but you can at least do your job, okay? Stay in there. Come on, son. You can survive, it's just, it's just, it's just a bow. It's just, just a bow. Okay, ah, bending over in this crap. Oh, let's, let's try that again, okay? You can project, hmm, borrow me here, all right. Well, come on. Energy, enthusiasm. One of the uses of a bow is a walking stick for an old man. Getting old. By the way, look at these points. Look at these. Look at these. See, see how pointy that is. We're going to get to. We're going to get to the point of the matter soon because there are, there's already a significant point when you look at the knocks on this thing. And so if someone's coming at me, and I what like. If I was gonna have a point like this, you don't need it curved, you could have it straight, you have it straight, and what if it was tipped with a bit of metal, okay? They're coming at you, and you just fall like you just gonna pick them up, right? This would be a deadly spear. Now, would it work if the bow was strung? We'll get there, we'll get there, because there's a couple of things to consider. So, uh, time to, time to string, time to string my, my, did I say it's a hundred pound bow? I've got, to, I've got to string my bow, which happens to be 100 pounds. And I thought you should know that it's a hundred pound, uh, in, ca in case you didn't know. Uh, 
Okay, so usually when I string this beast, it's an absolute monster. And look, I know that I know there are bigger bows. All right, uh, yeah, 120, 130, 150. Okay, I'm happy with 100. Happy with 100. Um, I might might work up to something bigger later on, but I just want to be able to shoot this as easy. The string fell. I want to be able to shoot this as easily as I shoot my 70 pound. It can take practice, but I can shoot it. But I haven't strung it like this. Not not yet. Not a single time because it's so heavy. But I did something weird the other. Like I, I had a I had a uh, you know archery session and I was unstringing my bows and without thinking. I just did it and I strung it with my foot. And I was like, just unstrung. Oh, okay. Maybe I actually can do it with my foot. So, all right. We'll see. Uh, uh, come on. Uh, uh, look at that. I can't. I couldn't do that when I bought this bow. By the way, I could not do it. So, tell you what, if you want to work out for your shoulders, my, my shoulders, they're looking defined. They're getting some definition and muscle onto them. So now, my bow, we, I'm not going to say it, my bow is strung. It is strung. So just, just quickly, quick test about, uh, you know, drawing this ah, in mail. Let's, let's give it a go. Oh, oh, hang on, I need to work, need to work into that. That wasn't... That, I'm going to make a video on drawing a long bow, uh, a big bow, you, you know, you know what, how big it is. Uh, the different techniques, because honestly, I wasn't doing a technique that helps me draw it then, okay? But, so I'm going to have a whole video on it that, oh, that's a bit better. So no, I'm going to do it. Oh, okay, so in mail, yes, that's fine. Let's talk about combat. So, a couple of things. Yes, there's a curve in it because it's strung, but it's not a huge curve, okay? And there's a lot of resistance to it. And so the question is, like, if you had a spearhead, like we're talking about an actual spearhead on the head of this bow, right? And someone was charging you, and you do, you're shooting and everything, and they're there, and so you just, like, like, I think you could get a good solid thrust in, like, several, like, and use it as a spear. I actually think this could be a really effective weapon. Like, you're coming in, you, you, you shoot, you grab it, and you're just like, ah, and you, and, you, and you use it as a spear. There'd be danger of it being damaged, of course. I'm not saying it wouldn't. Uh, less danger if you're going to whack hit with it. But the other thing is, like, seriously, when I'm holding it like this, and think about just whacking, right? There is so much more mass and strength and resistance in this bow compared to my bow, which is only 30 pounds less, 70 pounds, because you know how heavy this bow is. So it's a meme, I can't help it, okay? <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I'm laughing at a meme, I just can't help it. All right, so, so um, only 30 pounds different. The, 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 the contrast is striking when you're holding it. Like, uh, this was my um, uh, reaction to it when you're holding it. It's like, this is a sturdy, big bow, right? It's thicker, it's stronger, it's heavier, not hugely heavy, it's still, but it's got weight to it, that all round, a bow like this is a far more devastating melee weapon than any other bow I've ever used, okay? Especially thin, light, like flat bows, recurves, and lighter bows. So the key difference, as I mentioned before, is the type of bow, but not only the type though, the type of weight of bow, because as soon as you get into the 100 pound category, well, they have a lot more presence to them. Let's just call it, say, let's call it that, say that. Let's just say that. So, there's that. Now, what about something heavier? And so when we say something heavier, we'll be looking at a big, you know, spearhead. Uh, so, or, or even a potential polearm head. Could you get away with using something like that on a bow? I would say yes, but not very well. Uh, as soon as you have uh, a uneven distribution of weight on a bow, okay, uh, that is going to play havoc on it when you shoot this thing. Because <laughs> when you draw it, okay, the limbs are back a bit, and the limbs are going to be moving, it's not far, granted, it's not far from there to there, okay, and same with the bottom limb, because the limbs, as you'll see, they go back, Ugh. oh, I'm tired. <laughs> I think it's I think I think it's the mail. <laughs> okay. But anyway, as the as you draw it, oh I couldn't even get it in my ear then. 
I'm exhausted, man. Serious. But as soon as you draw it back, I hope you could see that the limbs went back as well. All right. So when you release it, if there's more weight here, you suddenly have more inertia at the top, which means it's going to take more energy for the top to accelerate than the bottom. And so what you're naturally going to find, and this is just physics, okay, if you did that with a significant weight difference on the top of the bow compared to the bottom, and I'm meaning significant, you wouldn't really notice too much of an issue if it was really light, but if it was significant and you shot it with a heavier weight like that, the bow is naturally going to do that, okay? It's going to kick up because the weight is going to be acting like an anchor and it'll be just going like that and that could play havoc on your accuracy. As to how bad, if you could adapt to it, no idea. And unfortunately, I'm not in a position to test. But I'm not sure it's even necessary because if you had a small, like, you know, bit of, bit of metal, like a spearhead right there, that is enough to do lethal damage, like seriously lethal damage. Like, and it doesn't need to be much. What about an arrowhead? You know, something metal, something pointy, just like that. Might be all that you need. Barely weighs a thing. It's enough to go through armor with the right force, okay? And depending on the type of armor, granted. Um, and the, the big difference is that you have reach with that. And that, that is actually a more debatable, defensible stance about would you just draw your one-handed sword uh, when you suddenly need to get into melee if you could do... <laughs> I think it's I think it's a plausible proposition, okay? Still, the sword has a lot of good advantages and it's better in close combat and, and close range and things. So having a sword is super awesome. Now, in terms of like techniques, fighting styles, using it like a martial arts thing, oh yeah there. Oh boy. You know attempt to flourish, I got so much crap on me, you know. So can you that's what I expected to happen. That's right. See, so I was going to try and do a whole, uh, but no, it's not, it's not too, too, too much crap. Martial art techniques, especially ones that utilize the string, like getting someone's head and then pulling. Oh, no, no, that's going to damage your string. Much higher chance to damage your bow. Low chance of doing proper damage. You see it in some fantasy kind of things. I remember the promo reel for uh, uh, Overwatch where you see, is it Gen no, Genji's the, Genji's the sword guy. I don't know, the guy that uses the bow is the samurai bowman, right? Uh, and he fights with his bow melee and he uses like these weird... And it, look, it's fantasy, it looks fun, not practical, and you wouldn't do it in real life. In fact, if you're ever using a bow in real life, you're going to be using far more practical, straightforward maneuvers, especially if it's a spearhead, just, just thrust, just thrust. But yeah, so fun, interesting things to consider, okay, when we're looking at possible ways a bow can be adapted into pop culture and fantasy. Uh, so, and, uh, there wasn't much historical validity to it, but in terms of fantasy, you just need it to be plausible because there are interesting things, right, that we can come up with in the modern day that are practical, would be useful, but because no one thought of it in the past, they didn't do it in the past. So the idea that this Anything that wasn't done in the past simply is impractical and would never have been done because they didn't do it. It's actually incorrect because it's not a matter that they didn't do it because it was this, heaps of people tried and found there was no validity to it at all. The other answer is that no one thought of it. And I think, you know, Jörg's instant legalist is an interesting discussion. Uh, Todd from Todd's Workshop is making one uh, out of medieval, uh, you know, uh, uh, components with medieval technology, and he shared some really good points that, you know, the bow, the simplicity of the bow means that he thinks it'll never go away. And after hearing that argument, I was like, you know, that's really true. The bow would never go away. But he was saying that there are areas in which the instant legless would be really useful, especially if you're in a situation where you just need rapid fire like that. And, and so a lot of people who are looking at this can see that, like, it, it seems like many people would definitely use something like that, but no one ever invented it, so they didn't. So the idea that no one used it, no, this is an argument I heard, but it is a vein of logic that I think people could uh, come up with that, is that if it wasn't done in the past, they were actually fighting constantly, and so those people innovating, they would have tried it, and if they not doing it, it's because it didn't work. And so, no, it just might not have been. So, ideas like this, uh, you know, I'm sure I, when I, no, I'm not sure. I would hazard a guess that someone in the past perhaps has used a bow in melee, and probably used it to a level of effect as well, okay? Uh, 
not widespread. We don't have any, not, no accounts to my knowledge, but it's a straightforward logical thing that if you're in a tight spot and you have a stick that has a bit of weight to it, you could whack someone with it and do some damage. It's straightforward. So, and then of course, yeah, you could explore different ways of doing it in fantasy and it's fun. That's what the whole thing, this is all is about, is just fun, interesting discussions. So this has been the fantasy rearmed analysis of the bow and different ways it can be used in adaptation fantasy. And so thank you. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.